You know, tomorrow is a uh, tomorrow is a very important day for this nation. You know, you think about all of the various holidays that we celebrate and that we enjoy in this country. And I don't know that there's one that is as meaningful or more meaningful than Memorial Day. You think about what that day means to us as a nation. You know, tomorrow we will remember. Tomorrow we will commemorate and honor those those who have served. How many of you have known personally, not heard of, how many of you have known personally of someone who has served our country in the military? Maybe you are one of them. But you, raise your hand if you know of somebody personally. That's a lot of people. So we're going we're gonna to honor tomorrow those who have served in our military, served our country, but not just served. We will remember tomorrow those who have given their lives to serving. And what I, what I mean by that is those who have not just served for a few years and, and, and then got out and nothing wrong with that, so I'm not saying anything about that, but those who have become career men, career women in the military, given their lives to serving. How many of you have known people that have done that? Not just served, but have, you've known personally somebody that's, that is a career person in the military. A lot of you. But Memorial Day is more than that. Memorial Day is not just about remembering those who have served. Not just about remembering those who have given their lives to serving. But what Memorial Day is mostly about is remembering those who have given their lives while serving. Who have lost their lives in service to their country. How many of you have known personally of an individual or individuals who have lost their lives, given their lives, while serving their country. You notice as we raise our hands, there were more at the beginning, fewer the second time, fewer the third time. And yet, aren't we all thankful that we live in a country where there are those that we can remember and be thankful for those who have served, those who have given their lives to serving, and then those who have paid the ultimate price, made the ultimate sacrifice in giving their lives while they were serving. I want us to use that as the basis for our study this morning. As we emphasize today, and our members will know what labors together with God is, as we emphasize today what we are doing and what you saw on the tables as you came in is the culmination of some things that have been happening over these last few months. But as we emphasize today, trying to get in step with those who have served. But now I'm not talking about those who have served our country. But I want us to think about those that we read about in our Bibles. Getting in step with those who have served that we read about in the pages of our Bible. We have, do we not? We have a number of outstanding examples. We have a number of outstanding individuals that we can look at in the Bible and get in line behind them to emulate their lives, to emulate their faith, to emulate their service. Turn with me to Romans chapter 16. As we begin this morning, as we begin looking at individuals, laborers who have gone before us and laborers that we can emulate and their service, Look in Romans chapter 16. There are two verses dedicated to a woman in Romans 16, and these are the only two verses that, that she has in the Bible. Now, that's better than some people. There's some, some people don't have any verses in the Bible, so if you got two, you're ahead of the game. You know, there, there's, some people, there's some people that even have a verse in the Bible, but their name isn't there. Well, they're ahead, they're ahead of the game, but here is a woman. We are given her name. We're given two verses about her. Now, why would God tell us about Phoebe? What is it about Phoebe in Romans chapter 16 that is important, not just for the church in Rome to know about, what is it about her that is important for us to know about her? We do not know much about this woman. We know that, we, that she was from Sincrea, which was one of the port cities of the city of Corinth, where Paul was when he was writing this letter to Rome. There's not much that we know about her, but we know two things about this woman. In Romans chapter 16, verse 1, I commend to you, Phoebe, our sister. Who is she? What do we know about her? She is 
a servant. She is one who serves, a servant of the church in Sincrea, that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and a sister in whatever business she has need of. Indeed, she has been not just a servant to the church in Sincrea, but she has been a helper of many and of myself also. What do we know about Phoebe? She was one who was a servant. The the word for servant here is likely tied to another verb in in, in the Greek language that was intended to mean haste, to pursue, to to go in hunt of something. So it wasn't that she was just a servant, but she pursued. She went in haste after serving. It wasn't something she had to do. It's not something she just waited around. Well, I, I'm not really going to do anything. If somebody asked me to do something, I'll do it. Okay, that's not the kind of servant she was. She was a servant who pursued and hunted opportunities to serve. She was someone who was known as a helper. I wonder as we think this morning about labors together with God, as we think about labors who have gone before us, if there's something that we can learn from a woman named Phoebe, two things that we know about her. I wonder if somebody were to identify two things that they know about us, what those two things might be. Turn your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 4 as we look at another man. 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul is writing his final letter from a Roman prison. It's the last time Paul likely was going to put pen to paper was writing a very uh, emotional plea to his son in the faith named Timothy. And as he is closing out his final words in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he makes reference to a number of individuals and he makes certain appeals to Timothy. And he mentions in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 11, not only Luke who was with him, but he asked Timothy, he says in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 11, get Mark. Now who's Mark? Mark was this man that we read about in Acts 13 and Acts 14. We know him over in Acts 13 and Acts 14 as John Mark. We know him as John Mark, who Paul took with him on his first missionary journey. But John Mark did not last very long. We don't know why, but for some reason, while they're on that missionary journey, John Mark turned back. You know, there's not many people that that what they're known for is turning back. If we were to talk about Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot and Lot's wife, we might remember about somebody who turned back. But there's not many people you think, well, they turned back. Here's John Mark. He was a servant. He was a fellow missionary with the Apostle Paul, but he turned back. In Acts chapter 15, when they got ready to go on their second missionary journey, Paul and Barnabas, who had been together on their first missionary journey, were ready to go on their second missionary journey. But Barnabas wanted to take John Mark with them. And Paul would hear nothing of it. He was a man who was not up to the task for the first journey. And Paul was not ready to take somebody who was not up to the task on the second journey. And so Paul and Barnabas parted ways. And Barnabas took John Mark with him on his own missionary journey. But Paul was not going to use John Mark again. He had failed him the first time. Here we are. Nearly 15 or more years later, in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 11, when Paul says to Timothy, get Mark, bring Mark with you. And how does he describe John Mark in this verse? For he, he was not at one time, but he is now useful for the ministry. Wonder if someone were to describe us. Describe our relationship to serving. Describe our relationship to ministering, which is just another word for serving. I wonder what word they might use for us. There was probably a word that Paul would have used about John Mark 15 years earlier in his relationship to serving then. But all of a sudden, things have changed in the life of Mark. As we think about these men of faith and these women of faith whom we need to emulate. Let us emulate their heart of service and ask the question, am I that kind of servant? Am I that kind of helper? 
If someone were to describe me as a serving minister, could I be described as useful? But I want us to go on to that second category this morning. Not only do we have laborers who have gone on before us, who we need to watch those who have served, but to that second category that we talked about earlier, those who have not just served, but those who have given their lives to serving. Look in Philippians chapter 1. Look in that passage that Scott read for us a few minutes ago. The ultimate example, I think, that we have. And sometimes we use Paul as an example maybe too much. And maybe sometimes we don't use him enough. Sometimes we may shy away from him because we think, well, Paul was perfect. You know, none of us are going to be perfect. So we can't, we can't lift ourselves up to Paul's level. And that's not true. Paul was not perfect. He was a human just like the rest of us. But look at Philippians chapter 1 about a man who gave his life to serving. Do you know Philippians chapter 1 and verse 21 where Paul said, For to me to live is Christ. Here's someone who not only served the Lord, not only a servant, not only a helper, not only someone who was useful to the Lord, he was someone who gave himself to the Lord. For to me to live is Christ. Life meant nothing else to Paul if it did not mean Christ. Life was of no value to Paul if it did not mean Christ. But you back up into verse 20. What does he say in verse 20? Here is Paul, he's writing, this is the first time he was in prison in Rome. He's writing Philippians from a Roman prison cell and he says, For to me always, not, not just now, but always, even so, even now, Christ will be magnified in my body. Whether it's by my life or even if it's in my death, Christ is going to be magnified. Your translation may say he's going to be exalted or your translation may say he will be honored in my life. But not just sometimes. Look at the word always. Paul was someone who gave himself to serving. You back up into verse 12 of this chapter. You back up into verse 12 and here was a man who was in prison. Here was a man who was, who was wrongfully arrested and bound. Here was a man who was transported to, to a prison over in Caesarea where he was kept up for two years because there wasn't somebody who had spine enough to hear his case and, and to make a, a real decision and judgment about his innocence. He's transported from that prison after two years in Caesarea, taken over to Rome, where he again is thrown into a prison. And what does this man say in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 12? What does the man say who has given his life to serving what does the man say who says, my life is all about Christ? He says, I want you to know, Philippians 1 and verse 12. I want you to know that the things that have happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. <laughs> what was Paul's life all about? All he looked at life at was through the eyes of Jesus. All he looked at his life at was through the eyes of the gospel. And he says, all of this bad stuff that's happened to me, it's been for good. Because it's actually caused the gospel to advance. It's actually allowed more people to hear the gospel. I wonder how we look at life. I wonder how we look at bad things that happen to us. I wonder how we look at, at trials that come into our life. And if we can give our lives to serving in this way, so that maybe we can see all things through the eyes of Christ. Turn your Bibles over to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Let's look at another example of, of individuals who gave themselves. Not, not only did they serve, but they gave their lives to serving. In 1 Corinthians chapter, 13, or chapter 16. 1 Corinthians 16, Paul is finishing up this first letter to the church at Corinth. He says to them in verse 13, watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, act like men, be strong. Let all that you, be do, all that you do be done with love. Now in verse 15, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 15, I urge you, brethren, you know about the household of Stephanus. You know about Stephanus' family? You know that they were the first fruits of Achaia and that they have, now it depends on what translation you have. 
The New King James says, They have devoted themselves to the ministry of the saints. I like the old King James here. Where the old King James says, They have addicted themselves to the serving of the saints, to the ministry of the saints. What had these people done? The Lord had become so focal, so central in their life. The service of the Lord, the ministering not just to the Lord, but ministering to the saints for the Lord had become so primary in their life and they had been doing it so much and so often, they had addicted themselves to serving. I know there are individuals here this morning who have struggled with addiction in your lives. Addiction to substances. Addiction to images. Addiction to games. Addiction to gambling. Addiction to all sorts of things. I wonder what would happen to us if we addicted ourselves to serving the Lord. Addicted ourselves to not just serving the Lord, but serving the Lord by serving each other. We have, we have some incredible examples of laborers in the Bible. Laborers who serve that we need to emulate their service. And laborers who serve by giving their lives to serving. And we need to ask ourselves the question, is that me? Is my life all about Christ? Is my life all about the gospel? Am I devoted to and addicted to serving God? But then there's that third category. Not just those laborers who have gone before us who have served. Not just those who have gone before us who have given their lives to serving. But those laborers who have gone before us who have given their lives while serving. We can look at a number of individuals in our New Testament that show us this kind of a life, but how about that first martyr? How about that first man who gave his life in service to the Lord in Stephen in Acts chapter 7? We won't take time to look at all of this, but in Acts chapter 6, there was a need among the church to serve and to help minister unto the widows. And so there were seven men selected from the church to serve the widows. In Acts chapter 6, the first seven verses, one of those men was named Stephen. In the very next verse in Acts chapter 6 and verse 8, the Bible teaches us, tells us, that Stephen began preaching. And the men, the, the Jews of the, of the city of Jerusalem did not like what Stephen was preaching. And in fact, when you get to Acts chapter 6 and verse 10, his, the wisdom of what he was speaking was so strong they could not resist it. They could not withstand it. They couldn't stop it. They couldn't answer him. And so they arrested him. They bound him. They brought him before the Jewish council. And in Acts chapter 7, you have the longest sermon recorded in the New Testament from a man that we know little about named Stephen. And he preaches unto them about God's plan being unfolded through the Jewish nation. He preaches unto them about Jesus, who he calls the just one. And he tells them that they had taken the just one and had crucified him, had put him to death. But he tells them that they were a stiff-necked people. You try telling somebody that and see how far you get with them. He tells them that they were a stiff-necked people people, stubborn people who would not listen to Jesus and they weren't going to listen to Stephen while he was preaching to them either. The Bible says in Acts chapter 7, the New King James says that these individuals were cut to the heart in Acts chapter 7 and verse 54. Well, that's not the same cut to the heart that we read about in Acts 2 and verse 37. Those people were cut to the heart because they believed that, that, that Jesus was the Son of God and they wanted to do something about it. These people were cut to the heart because they were enraged and angry. They took Stephen. After he had stood up for Christ, after he had stood for truth, they took Stephen and they stoned him to death. We're living in a nation that does not want to hear the truth. 
We're living in a nation where one day we may too be arrested for standing up for Christ. And here was a man who was willing to take it all the way. And even after he was arrested, stands on trial and preaches the truth. Even after he's dragged out of the city in Acts 7 to be stoned, he's still saying, I see the Lord. And even as they are killing him, he says in Acts chapter 7 and verse 60, Lord, do not charge this sin to them. We have before us individuals who have given their lives to serving. There's one individual that I don't know if you've ever heard his name. He's not in the Bible. His name was Polycarp. He was believed to have been a disciple of the Apostle John. Born somewhere around 69 or 70 A.D., lived 86 years. He was a man who became widely known for his faith in that second century. He was a man who lived amidst severe persecution against the church. He was a man who lived in the city of Smyrna, believed to be an elder of the church there in the city of Smyrna. And the Roman Empire was bringing great persecution against the church. In fact, the church in the, first, in the second century was being divided There was a division taking place in that second century church. A division that was taking place over those who were willing to confess their faith to Caesar in order to save themselves, save their families. And those who were willing not to confess Caesar, to stand up and never bow down to the emperor. Polycarp was one of those men who regardless of what they were going to do to him or to his family, he was not willing to bow the knee to Caesar. He was not willing to yield his faith in Christ. He lived 86 years. And the story goes that the Roman Empire had finally had enough of Polycarp. That he had been influencing Christians to not give in. His fame, his his influence, he he was known throughout the Roman Empire apparently for his faith in Christ. And so they finally sent soldiers to get Polycarp and to kill him. They went to Polycarp's home and he had gone out to a village city home. And his friends had urged him to run. Just run, Polycarp, run. We'll protect you. Just run for your life. Polycarp said, no, let the Lord's will be done. Those soldiers came inside the home and apparently were very perplexed that they had come to arrest an 86-year-old man, wondering what kind of, what kind of uh, thing that they were doing to arrest a man this aged. Polycarp gave them something to eat and to drink, these soldiers who came to arrest him. He asked them for an hour that he might go and pray. And apparently he prayed for two hours. Orally, they could even hear him pray. Finally, they bound him and took him away. He was brought before the local proconsul. And this local proconsul uh, interrogated him in front of the mob, interrogated him in front of the crowd to try to belittle him, to try to make him look like he's such a fool for standing up for Christ. Polycarp was unfazed. He wasn't intimidated by this proconsul for a second. So the proconsul got even more infuriated with Polycarp than he was before, and he started to threaten him. He said, I'm going to throw you to the lions. I'm going to burn you at the stake. Polycarp, almost as you read the story of this, you can hear the laughter in his voice. Polycarp said, you threaten me with fire. (laughs) You threaten me with fire that burns for an hour and then it's extinguished. But there is a fire of the coming judgment and of eternal punishment that is reserved for the ungodly. It shall never be quenched. You can see him pointing his finger, I'm sure. 
The proconsul became enraged again. Polycarp said, Why tarriest thou? Do what thou wilt unto me. It's interesting to read the story. That even some of those standing by and even some of the leaders begged him, Respect your age. Respect your family. Just deny Christ. What's the big deal? Just deny your allegiance to Him. Just offer your allegiance unto Caesar. Say, away with the Christians and your life will be spared. And Polycarp's most famous line, from all that has been recorded of him, when they begged him to deny his faith, to deny Christ, Polycarp said, Eighty and six years I have served Christ and He has never done me any injury. How can I then blaspheme my King and my Savior? His life is going to be taken but he says, there's no way I'm going to turn my back on Christ. And so the soldiers come. The soldiers come and take him. They collect all that is necessary to burn a man at the stake. They have gathered all that is necessary to start this fire. They take Polycarp and they are about ready to nail him to that pyre, to that pile. Nail him to that stake. They had to do that. Because when you light a man on fire, he will not stand still. So before they would ever burn someone at the stake, they had to nail them to that stake so that they could not get away from it so that they would stay there. Polycarp said as they came to nail him to that stake, Leave me as I am. For he who grants me strength to endure the fire will also grant me strength to remain as I am to that pyre unmoved and without the security of your nails. And so they just tied his hands behind him to that beam. Polycarp said a prayer. They lit him on fire. These are stories that we have that have been passed down from those who knew the life of this man named Polycarp. A man who was burned at the stake for his conviction, his devotion to Christ. I wonder if someone were to examine us. I wonder if someone were to put us on trial how far we would be willing to take our faith. How far are we willing to serve our God? Are we willing to serve Him to begin with? Are we willing to give our lives to serving Him? And would we be willing, if such were demanded of us, to give of our lives while... We are serving Him. You know, you look at our Savior, you look at our King, you look at our Lord, and you look at what He did for us. Jesus said, I did not come into this world to be served, but to serve. And of all of these examples that we've talked about this morning, there's no greater example than our Lord Himself. That He came to serve and to give us an example of what real service is is all about. And so this morning, as, as you leave, I want us to think about how are we using ourselves to serve our Lord? As you go about your life this week, how am I using my life to serve my King? For those of you who are visiting and those of you who are unaware, we have in this congregation, it's not really a program, but it, it's it's a project that, that we call Laborers Together with God. And what it is, is it, it is a way in which all that we do as a congregation is organized and structured under this, under, this, under this title of Laborers Together with God. 
And so all of our works and all of our various efforts, we, we've tried to, to coordinate them together so that we can all do more together than we could ever do separately. And so we all are trying to work together. And so uh, for the last several years, we've been involved in this and our deacons and our elders have been leading us in this effort of laborers together with God. And our deacons are right at the very focal of, point of all that happens with this and leading these various works and so those who are members of this congregation know that, that back in February that uh, every member of this congregation was, was given a booklet uh, like this one, that 45-page uh, booklet that had uh, 257 different opportunities to serve inside of this booklet. And every member was asked to take the booklet, find areas where you're zealous to serve, find areas where you're will willing to serve, mark those off, turn it back into the elders. And uh, after all of those were turned in, the elders and the deacons have gone through these. And uh, it's been interesting over these last few months to, to gather all of that data together, all of those check marks that you made in the books, to bring all of that together, to, to give that to the elders and deacons, say, here's where people want to serve. And, and, and for them to come back and say, okay, here's where we need people to serve, because unfortunately we can't use everybody in every place where they've volunteered to serve, although that'd be great. And so that the elders and deacons and, and various members have been working together over these last several months. It's been, like a, it's been like a huge jigsaw puzzle, and every one of them's had a piece here and a piece there, trying to fit it all together to see where can we use every member of this congregation the most to do the most. And so after these few months, it's time to let the members know, to let you know where the elders and deacons need you to serve. And so as you leave this morning out on the tables, there are envelopes out there for every member of this congregation. Just because maybe you did not fill out one of these booklets and didn't turn it in, there is an envelope out there on the table for every member of this congregation. The elders have written a letter uh, to every member uh, of, this, of the church. And uh, there is a letter out there uh, and an envelope out there to those, maybe you, maybe you didn't turn in a booklet. Maybe you were out of town. Uh, maybe you, uh, you, you didn't have time to do it. Uh, maybe you're, you're a new member since February and didn't have an opportunity to do it. There's, uh, and you didn't have to do it. There, there wasn't, uh, wasn't, uh, uh, wasn't demanded that you do that. Uh, but uh, there, if you would like to still get involved, there is some information in the envelopes uh, with your name out there in the letter from the elders, some information about how uh, you can get involved. There is a green sheet inside the envelope. If you didn't fill one of these out, there's a green sheet in there that says, here's some options for you. If you would like to get involved in the labors together with God, and basically it gives you four options. Uh, there's probably more than this, but first option is just see an elder. See any elder today, if you would like to get involved, and they'll give you one of these booklets. They have extra copies. They'll give you, an extra, they'll, they'll give you one of these booklets and you can fill it out and give it back to them. Or maybe you're somebody who doesn't want to fill out a booklet and you don't have to fill out a booklet. It's not required of you to fill out a booklet. But maybe you're someone who would like to see what sorts of things are there to be done in the church. Well, in this envelope that's out there for every member, there's also a, a small booklet. There's actually two small booklets. One of them talks about the works and programs of the church and shows you the whole structure about how it's put together and who's in charge of it. But there's also a booklet out there in your envelope that's called Contacts and Opportunities. And it lists all 257 of these opportunities that were given. Maybe you don't want to fill out a booklet, but maybe you just want to look at it and say, you know, where could I get involved? Because there's some things, that, some things that in reality you don't need to be assigned to do it. There's a number of things in here about praying for our missionaries, praying for our students, praying for our young people. Obviously, we don't need somebody to assign us to do that. You can just assign that to yourself. There's some things in here about visiting widows and visiting those in the hospital. Obviously, you can just do some of those things yourself. And so you might look through there and just say, you know, here's some things that I can do on my own. And I'll go ahead and do those and, uh, and do the very best that I can in serving in those ways. And, and maybe you look through there and, and you don't find something you'd like to do. If you would like to get involved in serving in this congregation and, and you have not been, uh, you've not been given an assignment to do that, then just see an elder. Say, so, you know, I want, to do, I, I, I want to be involved. How can I be involved? 
And our shepherds, our shepherds, I know, want to help every member of this congregation, just as Jerry said at the beginning of, of our service this morning. Our elders want to do everything that they can to help us to grow, to become complete in Christ, to become mature in Christ. And so, uh, and obviously some of you are doing things that, uh, uh, that uh, some of you are already doing things that, that you're not going to have as an assignment. Some of you are already doing things that, that you don't have to have an envelope to tell you, here's what you're doing. Some of you are already visiting. Some of you are already taking meals to people when they're sick. Some of you are already serving in worship. You don't have to have uh, an envelope that, that tells you necessarily how to do that, obviously. But for those members, uh, for those members who did fill out one of these booklets, uh, the elders have, have also written a letter out there for you and expresses their thanks for doing that and in, in closed, uh, enclosed, with, uh, enclosed inside your envelope is a yellow sheet. Does that look yellow? Not really. Uh, uh, there is a yellow sheet. Does that look more yellow? Uh, maybe. Uh, there is a yellow sheet. And inside your envelope, this yellow sheet lists where the elders and deacons would like you to get involved and to serve. And so along with that is that booklet that you can go to to find out more about the contact and that opportunity. Who's in charge of this? Uh, and what's going to happen uh, in, regards to, in regards to this assignment? There's also a, a reference number that you'll want to look at uh, on that yellow sheet because all of these uh, 257 works have a different reference number. But inside, inside that envelope is also a blue sheet. Everything's got colors, right? There's a blue sheet inside the envelope uh, for those of you who have filled out one of those booklets. And, uh, and the blue sheet indicates uh, just some instructions for you to, uh, to follow. To recognize that obviously the yellow sheet doesn't list everything that you're doing. And so if the yellow sheet doesn't say we need you to teach, uh, you know, in the primary classes and you're teaching now, don't think that means we don't need you to teach anymore. Or if, you're, if your yellow sheet doesn't say we need you to serve or to lead in worship, well, they don't need me to do that anymore. Uh, th- not every assignment is listed here, but only those that were a part of, of that booklet. Uh, but uh, we would like you to look through these assignments. would like you to look through this, uh, this blue sheet of paper. And, uh, and recognize that this is where the elders and deacons would like. And these are areas where you indicated an interest. We did not assign you to something that you did not, uh, uh, that you did not indicate an interest on your own. But go through uh, those things. And the design of this is for those elders, those deacons, uh, and those individuals who are responsible for these works that you are, have been assigned to, The design of this is that within the next two to four weeks, they will get in touch with you and let you know what's involved. You'll see uh, when you get your yellow sheet, you're just going to have a list of assignments. You may not know every detail or what's involved with all of those. Within the next few weeks, those who have been assigned as uh, being responsible for these items, they will get in touch with you. They will let you know what's involved and what you need to do. And if there's anything in this, that you say, you know, I didn't realize that, that's not really for me, then that's okay. Uh, you just let that be known, and this isn't something that, uh, that you're going to uh, be held uh, to do because you volunteered or because it's been assigned to you. If there's anything on this that you decide, you know, that's really not for me, or some list may be a little long, and you say, there's too much here for me to do, I can't do all of this, uh, then talk to the elders, talk to the deacons. Uh, they will be happy to work with you on all of these Uh, There's so much more that we could say about this, but please, every member of this congregation, please make sure that you stop by the tables uh, as you leave this morning. Uh, Over on the right as you exit, I think, is A through H. Right in the center is I through M. Over on the left as you exit is N through Z. And uh, find the envelopes. Um, Some of the families are stacked as a family. Just grab the entire stack uh, for your family and pass it out to them. And just as we have examples of those who have gone before us in serving, may we be an example for others around us in our service to our Lord. The last thing that we can all do, the last thing that we all need to do is to pray. To pray that God will use us. To remember that this service and these assignments and this labor is together with God to remember that it's not about us. It's not about me. It's 
It's not about the deacons. It's not about the elders. It's about our Lord. And it's about serving Him. And it's about putting our trust in Him. And putting Him first in all that we do. Let's pray together as we think about this day and what it means. Holy Father, we are so thankful to You that You have found a place for us to serve. We are so thankful for Your church. We're thankful that we can be a part of Your church. We're thankful that You've given us instructions by which we can be saved from our sins, that we can be added unto Your family so that we can have the promise of heaven. Father, as we have examined the example of those laborers who have gone before us this morning. Help us to be those who will serve, who will give our lives to serving you. And Father, help us to not be ashamed that if it becomes necessary, even in our own nation, that we will give our lives in service to you. Father, we thank you for loving us. We thank you that you have found a place for us in your kingdom. We pray that you will use us in every way that you can. Use us up in your service. May we, like Paul, be able to say that for me to live is Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, you think about getting in step with those who have gone before, but you can't get in step with those who have gone before us unless you are in step with our Lord unless you have followed His steps of salvation that He's laid out in His Word. Are you a Christian this morning? We would love nothing more than if you're not a Christian this morning than for you to give your life to the Lord. You can do that this morning. If you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, you believe that with all of your heart. I I don't believe that you would be here today, likely, if you did not have that faith. If you have that kind of faith in your heart, Willing to say, this life is not about me, it's about my Lord. Willing to turn away from sin and say, I want to give my life to my Savior. You can do that this morning. You can confess the faith that's in your heart, not because some man tells you to do it, but because the Bible teaches us that with the the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. This very day, you can do just as they did in the New Testament, to be baptized. Be baptized for the remission of every one of your sins. To be baptized into Christ so that the blood of Jesus can wash away your sins. You can be added unto His family, added unto His church. You can become a servant in His kingdom. With an opportunity to labor together with God for the rest of your life, serving Him faithfully. Are you in step with the Lord? The song says, the song we're going to sing says, it's only a step. Will you take that step this morning? Give your life to the Lord right now as together we stand.